you, during Jim's presentation, you, you were probably thinking, OK, yeah, that makes sense, or maybe it doesn't. Um, I'd really like to, oh, wouldn't it be terrific if I could just ask Jim to cover that and provide a, just expand on that a little bit maybe. And so, and maybe you've been following Jim Rickards for the last five years and there's just been a whole stack of stuff that you would like to ask him. Well, this is your opportunity to do that. We've got about 35 minutes. Um, and so what we'd like you to do is keep your questions reasonably short if you could because I think there'll be a number of people in the room with, that would like to get involved in this. So, um, yeah, please, keep those questions relatively short. So what we've, we've got Brian over there and, and, ja uh, and we've got Jared. And so what we'd like to do, we've got a gentleman who's already uh, taken advantage of the situation. He's put his hand up and he's, he's ready to go. And I know this man, his name is Vian, and it doesn't surprise me that he's, uh, he's taken advantage of this. So that's, but that's the way it works. If you want to ask a question, just please quickly raise your hand so that we can see it clearly. And either Brian or Jared will take the microphone to you and direct the question to Jim Rickard. So why don't we start with you, Vian? Thank very you. basic, very basic question. Uh, what are some of the reasons why you do not recommend Bitcoin as an investment? Um, a couple of reasons. Number one, a lot of the participants in the Bitcoin market are uh, <clears throat> drug dealers, uh, arms dealers, uh, tax evaders, money launderers, terrorists, uh, and worse. I, I won't even go into what's worse than that, but it, it does exist. <coughs> uh, pardon me. Um, some of the occupational hazards of what I do is you occasionally uh, lose your voice. Um, the way uh, a lot of the Bitcoin traffic's on what's called the dark web, uh, there's a notion that somehow governments can't penetrate that or can't understand it. That's not true. Most Bitcoin holders are uh, keep their their digital wallets or their accounts at Bitcoin exchanges. You don't have to do that. Some people can have an individual Bitcoin wallet or you can have what's called a brain wallet where you just memorize your code. But uh, most people don't do that. They keep it at exchanges. These exchanges are unregulated, untested. Um, there have already been some very well-known frauds. I expect there will be more. Um, the market, um, somehow Bitcoin believers would have you think that this is the only market in the history of the world that has not been manipulated, knowing that every other market, you know, money, stocks, bonds, gold, silver, they've all been manipulated in different ways. The entire global structure regulation that we have today was designed to deal with frauds and manipulations from, you know, Bernie Madoff uh, uh, to the original Charles Ponzi, who gave the, the, the Ponzi scheme its name. But somehow Bitcoin is, and well, that's not true. Uh, you know, let's say you and I both own Bitcoins and they, we were miners and they, it was going down and we wanted to sort of get the market up. Well, I could sell you a Bitcoin for 4,000. You could sell it back to me for 4,100. I sell it back to you for 4,200. You sell it back to me for 4,300. We keep going. This is called painting the tape. This is the way they <laughs> manipulate stock markets. And then all the public sees, oh, Bitcoin's 42, 43, 44. And give me something. You know, the next thing you know, it's six, seven thousand $7,000. But it's all coming from wash transactions by the miners themselves who have an interest in this. And then beyond that, Bitcoin has not been tested in a market uh, turndown. Uh, Bitcoin um, was invented in 2009. Uh, we have not had a uh, other brief one in Europe, but Australia, Canada, most of the major economies, certainly in the US and China, have not had a recession. There has not been a financial panic since Bitcoin was invented, so we don't know how it behaves. I've seen. The other asset classes I mentioned, stocks, bond, real estate, gold, et cetera, I've seen how they perform in good markets and bad, but we don't know how Bitcoin will perform. So it's a, it's a little bit like a weapon system that hasn't been tested um, in a real battle. Uh, I, I um, could go on if you want to put it in um, anthropological terms. Uh, think of modern human beings, but uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, but if you go back to the hominids uh, three million years ago, there were many, many branches of that family tree that died out. Now Neanderthals and Australopithecines and others, uh, many, our, our branch survived all of this, but there were a lot of dead ends. I think we'll look back. I'm not saying that uh, digital cryptocurrencies don't have a place. I mean, for that matter, the U.S. dollar is a digital cryptocurrency. Uh, you know, I may have a few dollars in my wallet, but most transactions use a credit card, a debit card direct pay from your employer, 
you pay your bills online, et cetera. The vast majority, certainly commercial transactions, the vast majority are, are digital and all that message traffic is encrypted using the same 256-bit military-grade encryption that uh, the blockchain uses. So um, we already have digital cryptocurrencies. They're called dollars, yen, yuan, et cetera. So there's nothing new about it. What's new, as I mentioned, is the distributed ledger uh, uh, technology. But and Bitcoin has a fundamental has a number of fundamental flaws. It's not highly scalable, which means as more and more processing power is needed, uh, it can't um, be transacted quickly enough to keep up with the potential demand. Also, as you know, the algorithm behind Bitcoin says, uh, I think the number is 22 million. I, I could be off a little bit on that, but there are only 22 million Bitcoin that will ever be created. Uh, we're somewhere along that line. I think it's at 14, 15 million now. But the way it works, the miners who create Bitcoin using massive computing power, by the way, the reason most of the miners are in China is because they have cheap electricity. Um, they, uh, they use this computing power, but each uh, what's called proof of work or each solution to the new block that then gets distributed on the distributed ledger requires progressively more processing power than the one before. You will get to the point where it would actually exceed the, the computing power in the world. You'll need more energy than the sun to do it, which means you'll never get there. So there's a finite number of Bitcoin. But as I showed this morning, um, one of the attractions of gold as a form of money is that it's stable. But that's because um, it, creates, it encourages price stability. But that's because the amount of gold is roughly equal to the population increase of the world. Now, I don't know why that's, and that's factually true. I don't know why it turns out to be true. There's something, you know, maybe deeper there in terms of scaling metrics that, that we have to study and think about. But that's one of the attractions of gold. And of course, money can be uh, promoted at a rapid rate. But you have to have an expanding money supply to go to an expanding, with an expanding economy. You, um, you don't want to expand it too fast or you'll get inflation. But money does have to grow as the economy grows. Otherwise, you get deflation. Uh, so if you hold the money constant, and then so if you're using Bitcoin as the basis of a monetary system, and you're trying to create a Bitcoin economy, Bitcoin debt, you know, et cetera, uh, but the, the, the value is constant while the economy is expanding, what happens is Bitcoin creates a natural deflationary bias, which is one of the things that's pushing the dollar value of Bitcoin up at the moment. But but the point being, if Bitcoin can't expand with the economy, it has no use for an economy because why would you borrow in a currency where the real value of the currency keeps going up and makes your debt harder to repay? Debtors don't like inflation. They like deflation. So Bitcoin is a very unattractive medium in which to borrow. And if that's true, you don't have any debt. If you don't have any debt, you can't have an economy. In other words, economies aren't based on money. They're based on money plus credit. And it's hard to see a credit economy, a credit ecosystem, um, being created around Bitcoin because why would you borrow in a deflating currency? So I see Bitcoin dying out like the Neanderthals. Distributed ledger is here to stay. If, if you could, please, uh, when you asked Jim the question, could you please just uh, introduce yourself at the same time? Thank you. Hello, Jim. Uh, Anthony Bailey. Um, thanks very much for being here and taking the question. Um, you've talked a lot about the uh, US debt, uh, the to GDP, the um, Fed balance sheet, and the potential of the US dollar um, losing its status as world reserve. But in your um, ideal personal portfolio, you still had a lot of uh, treasury notes and treasury bills. Um, if we have the Armageddon moment, would, is that such, why, is, why are you doing that? Is that so wise if all these um, weakness factors in the US economy could destroy those? Well, I think it's important to understand that um, using complex dynamic systems analysis, I'm trying to look forward. Um, that's the portfolio today. It might not be the portfolio a year from now. It might not be the portfolio two years from now. So I, what, one of the things I emphasize in my newsletters and in my books is, uh, you know, stay with the updates. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter at James G. Rickards. I use my middle initial at James G. Rickards. Um, my newsletters come out weekly or monthly. My books come out once a year. Um, there, might, there might come a time. There might come a time when that portfolio is 50% gold and 50% cash. But it's not there yet. So uh, I described earlier how inflation and deflation are both in play. Well, you want an inflation hedge for sure. But it might be good to have a deflation hedge also. I might not want cash for a long period of time uh, if the... 
uh, dollar's role was going to be diminished in the global financial system, but for right now, it's still king dollar. So I, I think one of the conceptual problems people have is, you know, you, you, you mention something, you give them an idea, and they lock it in, and like that's it forever. That's a really bad way to allocate. That's a really bad way to handle your assets and understand the economy. You, you might have something that's optimal at a point in time. You have to look for developments, update your hypothesis, look for news, look for changes, and then be nimble. Uh, so uh, I, that portfolio is what I have. I mean, I have silver, gold, land, fine art. I don't, I don't know if fine art was on there. It's hard to invest in, but I do have fine art. Um, I have private equity. I, I, have all the, you know, I have all the things I mentioned up there. Uh, it's kind of an optimal portfolio, but, but it could change, probably will change. And so I don't think that some future state of the world is the way to assess it that's optimal for today. Uh, th thanks for allowing me to ask this question. You tend to be very positive about the euro, but the situation in Europe is actually worse than in America. So how do you see the future of the euro in this uh, event that's coming? Well, I don't think you can talk about Europe. I, I talk specifically, we can, but I talk specifically about the European Monetary Union or the so-called Eurozone. So I don't pay as much atten attention to all the countries in Europe, and I don't pay as much attention to the European Union. I look at the European Monetary uh, Union or the Eurozone. So that's what I'm talking about when I say Europe. Uh, look, four years ago, uh, Paul Krugman, Noriel Rubini, Joe Stiglitz, all these guys were running around with their hair on fire saying the Euro is falling apart. Uh, Greece should be kicked out of the Euro. Spain should quit. Go back to the Peseta, lower the unit labor costs. There should be a northern tier and a southern tier. Uh, Europe is a doomed monetary, experience, uh, monetary experiment. I said, no, it's all nonsense. Nobody's leaving. Nobody's getting kicked out. It's strong and getting stronger. Countries will be out of it. And that's exactly what's happened. No one's left. No one's been kicked out. When I said this, there were 16 members. Today, there are 19 members. Soon there'll be 20. Uh, Scotland may be the 21st. Um, they have more gold than the United States collectively. They have 10,000 tons. We have 8,000 tons. They have a higher gold to GDP ratio than we do. Uh, I can't speak for Australians, but I'll say Americans don't understand Europe. Uh, and the reason is they get their information from the, uh, from the Financial Times and The Economist. They're not European, they're English. They hate Europe. Um, the Americans who get their information from London are getting their information from people who are, hate Europe. Um, uh, it's good that the UK is leaving the EU because they never should have joined the EU. I mean, the right choice for the UK, join the EU and adopt the euro or keep out. But joining the EU and keeping your own currency never made sense. Uh, and just at a deeper level, you know, what, is, what Stiglitz and Krugman were talking about, they were saying, well, you cannot have a monetary union unless you have a fiscal union. And, and you don't have a fiscal union. You know, Greece can run deficits and Germany can run a surplus and each country does its own thing on the fiscal side. How can you have a monetary union if you don't have a fiscal union? So therefore, it's doomed to fail. That statement is correct, but the conclusion is incorrect. Because at the time of the Maastricht Treaty in 1991-92, when they were putting this forward, uh, they, by what, they had a think tank that worked for 10 years to come up with the convergence criteria and how, what all these currencies would be worth in terms of the new euro. They knew, they knew at the time that a monetary union without a fiscal union would not work. But they also knew that the people of Europe were not ready for a fiscal union. That was giving up too much sovereignty too quickly. But they kind of liked the idea of a monetary union. So they said, well, let's do half now. We know it's going to break down, but then we'll do the other half when it breaks down. So in, as far from abandoning the first half, what you do is you move to the second half. It's called piecemeal engineering. And that's exactly what's happened in Europe. In the last five years, they have unified banking regulation, unified deposit insurance. They're working on a fiscal union right now. They're talking about a Eurozone parliament, so not, not, the, Euro, not the EU parliament in Brussels, but a Eurozone parliament of members only of, of those who back the Euro, where they could vote on fiscal policy, a unified finance minister for the Eurozone. True Euro bonds, I don't mean dollar denominated bonds issued in Europe, I mean <coughs> European bonds denominated in Euros backed by the full faith and credit of the Eurozone. So all these things are happening. They're actually accelerating because of the stresses, you know, not just Brexit, which didn't directly affect the Euro, but you're looking at Scotland leaving the UK. Um, there are nationalist movements in Italy. There's some talk about 
Northern Italy breaking away, you know, the situation in Catalonia, which obviously is being suppressed. That was easy to see coming. Uh, so my point being, you know, when you ask Angela Merkel about this, her solution is not break up Europe. Her solution is more Europe. And that's the expression they use, more Europe. So, um, so that no one's leaving. No one's getting kicked out. They're getting stronger. Um, and you're going to see these European-wide institutions. But I'm not surprised Americans and perhaps others in the English-speaking world don't get it because they're reading Lon London publications. All right. This gentleman uh, here. A gentleman here. Do you have a... Gary, Gary Williams. Uh, thank you. Could every could everyone uh, could everyone hear the question? I can. No. Okay. Can uh, we have a microphone down here? Yeah. Well, well yeah, I'll uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll go with, I'll, I'll repeat the question. The gentleman asked what, what motivates me to do what I do because I've had a long career in law, economics, um, work with the U.S. government, public policy, met a lot of top echelon officials. Why? Uh, am I you know, traveling, doing events, writing, et cetera? Um, the answer is twofold. Number one, I enjoy it. I like meeting people. I like travel. And uh, I, I love writing. And I'm very privileged to have two great publishers, my book publisher, uh, Penguin Random House, and my newsletter publisher, Agora Financial. They've both been very supportive. So um, what's better after a long career in the trenches of finance and derivatives and bonds and uh, uh, banking and hedge funds and a lot of other things than just to be a writer. So it's something I enjoy very much. But I also um, don't like it when I see the elites signaling each other. They know the system is unstable. They know it's going to collapse. They've rigged it in such a way that they're going to get their wealth out of it and they're going to be on their yachts and have their homes in Nantucket or the Gold Coast or whatever and leave everyone else holding the bag. And I find that sort of morally reprehensible. And uh, so I try to do my bit just to, uh, I, I think it's all about education. Look, everyone's, you know, if you have the right education and the right information, you're smart enough to know what's in your best interest. You know how to invest your money. You know how to allocate your assets. You don't need a wealth manager to tell you, but what you and, and I and what all of us need is that educational foundation so we understand how the system works, we understand what money is, so that we can make smart decisions. So I, I view what I do as kind of almost like a teacher or a professor and just trying to Im hopefully improve financial literacy, but I get to do it in a way that I enjoy doing. So. Thank you. Okay, gentleman with the microphone over here. Uh, hi, um, my name is Randall Penny. I'm a consultant in the oil business. Um, I've just, uh, my interest, uh, my worry regarding gold um, uh, and precious metals generally um, is, uh, you know, it's okay, if you, you purchase um, gold and, and, and so on, uh, and you hold it in various repositories, um, uh, and one of the biggest fears is, uh, is obviously is confiscation um, from uh, governments and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, to, I'll be straight, um, I mean, I, I, I have a worldwide, uh, you know, this worldwide in different repositories around the world. So the question that arises me, for me is, is if the world banking system collapses, as so many people are seem to be predicting, and I'm getting a lot of things on, the, on the, the, that banking will become a major problem, um, how are we going to get in a big freeze up, how are we going to get hold of our, um, our precious metals and even convert it into currencies, let alone anything else, um, in, 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 in a, the very crisis that we are buying this as a hedge against? Well, in the first instance, you won't have to convert it into currencies because it will be the currency. Um, the second point is uh, do not keep your precious metals in a bank. Uh, that's the worst place to put it. You're right. Mm -hmm. In a crisis, and the banks will be the first one to close their doors. And I mentioned earlier uh, in my visit to Switzerland that the, the private storage facilities, the people who run private vaults, tell me that their customers are taking the gold out of the banks and putting it into these private facilities. And, you know, Loomis is, is one of the biggest, but there are other ones out there, Brinks, Dunbar, uh, 
Uh, you know, they're very good names. Brinks is a very reputable name. I'm sure they're here in Australia. So <clears throat> my point being, um, uh, do not put your money in the bank. That's a really bad idea. There's a very high conditional correlation. The day you want your gold the most is the day the banks will be closed. You'll be knocking on the door and you won't be able to get it. So I recommend non-bank storage. Um, I think people have to take responsibility for paying attention. Uh, I've talked about some pretty dire financial conditions, yeah. <clears throat> they can happen quickly, that's true. I recommend getting your gold now, don't wait, because you might find that you know, the gold dealers are not answering their phones because they're back ordered and the mints are back ordered, so the time to get it is now. Um, but um, we'll see this coming, we'll see this getting worse. So mm -hmm. it, the announcement will come overnight, but you would have to be pretty inattentive mm -hmm. not to see it coming. This is one of the things I do, and again, my, whether it's my Twitter feed or newsletters or books, I try to uh, stay ahead of this and caution people. So two things, number one, um, I keep my bank in non-bank storage. Number two, you know, don't go to sleep, pay attention, and you'll, you'll see some things coming. If you're really, really worried about it, um, you can store it at home. Uh, by the way, the best, you know, safes are nice and alarms are nice and all that. The best um, home security system is don't tell anyone you have it. You know, don't, don't go to a cocktail party and say, I got all my gold, you know, it's in the, it's in the garage. You know, just, <laughs> just keep it to yourself. By the way, I don't have it at home and it's not in my garage. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, that's, um, uh, I think non-bank storage is the way to go. And then if, it, and pay attention. And if you th see things getting more dire, then you might want to move it a little closer to home. Okay, so Back my again. name's Claire Geisler. Um, my question is, what do you see with the storm coming, happening to the Swiss franc? Um, right now, I'm very bullish on the Swiss franc. It had uh, a large run up, and then it came down a lot. Um, and um, I think it's paused for, uh, for a, a bounce back. Uh, it's, you know, it kind of, the Swiss National Bank has been doing everything possible to trash the Swiss franc. They, they print Swiss francs to buy euros to suppress the value of the Swiss franc. But going back to uh, late 2014, they were very close to owning every euro in the world. There was going to come a time when the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank would be every euro stock, euro bond, euro deposit you could find and all designed to suppress the Swiss franc and it wasn't working. And then on January 15, 2015, they, by the way, the head, uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Jordan, the head of the Swiss National Bank said in December 2014, we're not going to devalue, uh, we're not going to revalue the franc. That was the question. We're not going to revalue the Swiss franc. Uh, one month later, he did that uh, to the shock of the world. The euro fell 20% against the Swiss franc in one hour. It was really a chart. January 15, 2015. Look at the euro Swiss franc cross rate. It fell 20% in one hour. Um, so then they was just, that's just central banks throwing in the towels. Like when George Soros broke the Bank of England. It, it, whenever you see a peg, you can be certain it's going to break. Because if, if, it was, if there wasn't market pressure to go the other way, you wouldn't need the peg, right? The reason you have a peg is because you're fighting the market. Well, you can win in the short run, you'll always lose in the long run. We'll see that in China. So now the, the uh, Swiss National Bank has, uh, again, uh, had some success in pushing down the value of the Swiss franc. But with the scenarios I see, including the North Korean war scenario that I talked about earlier, uh, the, look, the U.S. dollar will be a safe haven, um, but emerging markets currency is going to get crushed and there'll be just as many hot money inflows into Switzerland as there are to the U.S. and the Swiss National Bank will not be able to stop it. So I'm very bullish on the Swiss franc. Okay. Hi, Jim. My name's Yanni. Uh, my question is in regard to um, the fact that the system is so unstable. And everything you've just pointed in your presentation points to the fact that it's inherently unstable. Um, why hasn't all the gold been bought up already by wealthy individuals? Why is it even still available at these prices? Well, the key part of that question is at these prices. Uh, there's not that much gold available. Uh, the, uh, you know, I talked to the, I met with the largest refiner in Switzerland um, in a, a little town called uh, Mentrisio near Lugano, not far from the Italian border. Um, so again, this is the biggest refinery in Switzerland. They just expanded their capacity. They're working 24 hours a day. They have triple shifts, so they work around the clock. Um, he says, I produce um, 
20 tons a week. China buys 10, that's 500 tons a year. That's just from one refinery, that's not counting all the other places. And Chinese gold production is 450 tons a year and they have their own refineries, et cetera. Um, he said, but I, China wants all of it, but I won't sell on the rest because I've got my regular customers like Rolex watches or you know Cartier jewelry or whoever it might be. He said, Jim, if I didn't know you and you, know, you called me for gold, I wouldn't take the call because we're not taking any new business. So, um, and he said, I'm having trouble sourcing. A refinery gets, all they do is they take gold in one form and they turn it into a different form. Four nines, you know, uh, kilo bars, et cetera. Uh, and, but they get it from the miners in a form called Dore, which is, you know, 80, 90% gold. But these, these gnarly, uh, not quite gold bars come in from the mines. They melt those down and refine them. The other source are existing gold bars coming out of vaults, uh, mostly in London. And the third source is what they call scrap. You and I would call it jewelry, but it's you know, bangles and necklaces and all this stuff you don't want anymore. Um, so they take in Dore scrap and existing gold bars and they refine it. He said he was having trouble sourcing, that they couldn't get enough gold to keep up with the demand and they weren't taking any new business. So that's the state of play in the real gold world. Uh, but when you come to the paper gold world, it's, it's an alternate universe. It's like bizarro world. Um, you know, if I want to, here's the thing. If I wanted to short 10 tons of gold, so let's say you're a dealer and I'm a dealer, and I say, you know, sold to you 10 tons, and you're like, okay, Jim, you know, you got a week to deliver this gold. I couldn't find it. I could call JP Morgan. I could call LB in my back. Try finding 10 tons of gold in one week. You can't do it. Try finding 10 tons of gold in 30 days. You can't do it. Now, give you enough time, yeah, eventually you'll do it, but that's way beyond the normal delivery periods. But if I want to sell 10 tons of gold in the Comex, nothing to it. I you know, call my broker, you know, sold. Uh, you got to pay some margin, pay the commission to the brokers, whatever. But um, so I can sell all the gold. I can sell 50 tons. I can sell 100 tons of paper. I just can't sell real gold because I can't source it. Mm. Um, and so the paper manipulation suppresses the price. Uh, why is this going on? Well, there are a number of reasons, but the main reason is that uh, this goes back to the history of the international monetary system, but let's just go back to the 1950s and 1960s. So in 1950, the United States had 20,000 tons of gold. In 1970, the United States had 9,000 tons of gold. Where did the 11,000 tons go? I went to our trading partners. If you 3,000 to Germany, 2,000 to Italy, 2,000 to France, 600 to Netherlands, 400 to Japan, et cetera. If you traded with the United States, sold us you know, Volkswagen cars or Sony radios or Italian wine, whatever it was, you got dollars. And in those days, you could take your dollars and turn them in and get gold. And they did, and that's how they got the gold. Except that by the late 60s, there was a run on the bank and Nixon closed the window and no more gold. They said, you can buy stocks and bonds, you just can't get the gold. Uh, but that's where that 11,000 tons of gold went. Now come forward 30 years. Who's got the trade surplus? Who's the big trading partner? China. So China's selling us all this stuff and they're getting paid in dollars, but they can't get any gold. They got Yang money. I mean, we were, they're like, where's our gold? You know, the, all you Germans and French, you got the gold under Bretton Woods. We're not getting the gold. So the deal is, okay, you got to get the gold. Everyone knows China has to have the gold, uh, but you got to go buy it. You can't cash it in at Fort Knox at a fixed price. You've got to go buy it. Well, if you trade in any market, what happens when you go into a market? You're the big foot. You're, you're, you got the big bid. You know, the supply's scarce. You're the big bidder. What's going to happen to the price? It's going to skyrocket. And China's trying to get a gold to GDP ratio. Their GDP is expanding, so it's a moving target, so they have to get more and more gold. But the scarce supply, so when you buy it, the price keeps going up. So what you have to do, it's a two-sided approach. You have to suppress the price so China can get the gold it wants to be treated fairly in this international monetary system. But then once China gets enough gold, which they don't have already, but once China gets enough gold, then they won't care about the price because they can let it go to the moon. Yeah. But if you were, this sounds funny, but if you were a buyer, would you want the price to go up or down? You'd want it to go down, right? If you're still buying, if you have all the gold you want, you want it to go up, that's easy. But if you're a buyer, you want to keep buying, you want the price to stay low, as long as you're sure it's going to go up in the end. And it is going to go up in the end for the reasons I demonstrated. So China's in this curious position. 
They want a low price today um, because they're still a buyer by the hundreds or even thousands of tons. But they all know that the price is going to skyrocket in the end game. We're just not there yet. And if China uses the futures market to suppress the price of gold, the United States government will not touch it. They will not investigate that. You can't investigate a size. You know, a small, sleazy broker, yeah, they'll put you in jail. But a, a sovereign country the size of China, this is a very deep game. They won't, they won't investigate that. Now, having said that, people say, why should I buy gold if, if the price is going to get suppressed? The answer is uh, it's unstable and it's, um, it, it cannot be continued much longer. So, so th you know, buy, buy gold at today's price and say, thank you, China, for keeping the price down. And then you'll participate when it skyrockets sooner than later. We have time for one the, more. Yeah, one more. That's it. One more question. Who has a microphone at the moment? We have over here. We have over here. Okay. Hi, Jim. Thanks for being here today. Thank My you. name is Hans Peter. Um, I just have a very simple question. What's your view on Glass Steagall? Um, the uh, for those who don't know, the question: What's my view on Glass Steagall? Glass Steagall was a law passed in 1933. Uh, so we've got to go back to the 1920s. So what happened in the 1920s? Commercial banking, which is deposits and lending, and investment banking, which is underwriting and sales of securities, were all done in the same institutions, um, Citibank or First National Citibank and Morgan and, and Goldman and the rest. So the bank said, aha, why don't we create some really garbage securities and sell them to the customers. Isn't that a good business model? And that's exactly what they did. They made a lot of bad loans, wrapped them up in securities, and sold them to the customers. So then we had the collapse, the crash of the stock market, the Great Depression, and Congress had hearings. It was called the Procura Commission reported, and the Congress passed a law. And they said, well, okay, here's the deal. From now on, you can take deposits and make loans, or you can underwrite and sell securities, but you cannot do both. You have to separate commercial banking and investment banking. You cannot do both because there's an inherent conflict of interest. The temptation always is to create lousy securities and sell them to the customer. So take deposits, make loans, or underwrite and sell securities, but not both. That was Glass-Steagall. That was the law in the United States for almost 70 years. It was the law until 1999, and then the Congress in 1999, on a bipartisan basis, led by Phil Graham, a Republican senator, Bill Clinton, a Democratic president, they thought they were smarter than the people in 1933. They thought they knew better. They said, oh, well, we got all this modern financial technology and value at risk and risk management. And we're not, we're not going to make those mistakes. We got this figured out. And then Sandy Weil and the lobbyists, you know, go ahead. And they get Glass-Steagall repealed. What happened? the banks went out, organized garbage securities, and sold them to the customers. They did the same thing they did in the 1920s. What a surprise. It was just a replay. And 10 years later, the world collapses. We had another collapse, completely predictable. Um, so, so, you know, the Congress in 1999s were, in, in Congress in 1999 were actually idiots. The, con the Congress in 1930 knew what they were doing. So you have a law. It solves a problem. It works perfectly for 80 years. And then you think you're smarter than that, and you tear it up, and within 10 years, right on time, you get the global financial crisis. So Glass-Steagall was a big part of it. There are a lot of people who say it, it wasn't. Sorry, I spent way too long. And I worked at commercial banks, investment banks, hedge funds, and I ran a stock exchange. So there aren't too many people who have seen as many facets of this as I have. And I can tell you that, that was, the global financial crisis was a predictable result of the repeal of Glass-Steagall. So what's the answer? Bring it back. Se you know, separate commercial and investment banking. Odds of that happening are close to zero because the lobbyists own Washington. I was actually in a meeting with uh, uh, a closed door meeting with uh, all the U.S. Treasury officials in charge of risk management. This was the staff of the Financial Services Oversight Committee, which is the main risk management body in the U.S. government. And they invited me down. They were very nice and to give them a risk management talk, which I did, telling them the same thing I'm telling you. And in the middle of my talk, I interrupted myself, and I turned to this Treasury official, and I said, you know, I don't envy your job because the lobbyists and the banks own this town. And I expect him to jump out of his seat in outrage and say, what are you talking about? He didn't. He looked at me and said, you're right. So, you know, closed doors. I won't mention his name. But, the, but my point being, the lobbyists do own Washington. The banks do own Washington. You're not going to see Glass-Steagall, what you should expect in the fullness of time is another catastrophe. And on that happy note, I thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>